Oh, it's great to be here again uh, amongst the Bayside people. Went for a walk down the, uh, the beach today, saw some dolphins. So uh, get out there when you can, when the water's nice and calm and you never know what you'll see out there. Um, yeah, it's, it's very good to be here. Look, you don't have to call me Mr. Heat Pump. I mean, you could call me Tim if you want to. Uh, no one has ever called me Mr. Heat Pump, but I put that up to kind of send a message about this phrase, heat pump. What is a heat pump? How can we use these things to extract free renewable heat from the air outside our homes to cheaply heat our homes and to heat our water? How do these heat pumps work? Um, it turns out that in Tasmania, they were trying to market them as reverse cycle air conditioners and they weren't getting anywhere. But once they started calling them heat pumps in Tasmania, then people started understanding that these things can be a way to heat your house. So uh, that word heat pump, we haven't really used it that much in mainland Australia, but maybe, maybe it's a useful thing to try to remember. Um, climate change. Yeah, there's so many levels uh, that climate change needs to be addressed. Governments at all levels obviously need to be doing more. Businesses need to be doing more. But there are things that we can do in our homes. We're not going to solve climate change just by doing things in our homes. But there are things that we can do, and that's what we'll talk about tonight. And uh, happy to take questions about anything having to do with home energy and comfort tonight, not just about heat pumps because it's all, it's all connected how that all works. Um, so the next slide, please. <clears throat> this is a, if it comes up, yeah, there we go. This is an age article from 2008, from BCAG back in 2008. So goodness me, what's that, 11 years ago? This is Mark Slykus. And back then we had the Residential Energy Efficiency Program, which was something we partnered with the council and then volunteers from the group went out and helped other people throughout Bayside to try and improve their homes. And uh, Alan Pears uh, was our guru there. He uh, offered the instruction for the volunteers. And that was the beginning of my, my you know, more formal introduction and, and education about home energy. Um, <clears throat> thanks to Alan there as the guru for that program. Because previously, uh, you know, my former life, I trained as a chemical engineer in America. And it was the oil and gas industry that brought me to Australia. And I've worked on the oil platforms down in Bass Strait and up in the Timor Sea and around the world, those sorts of places. So I certainly wouldn't be here tonight. My wife wouldn't be here tonight, but for the oil and gas industry. So that's, <laughs> that's the way it goes. Um, but these days, um, I have uh, set up a bit of a business where I do go into people's homes, spend three hours with people, and we, we look at everything and uh, we try to identify the most uh, useful things that people can do to improve their homes. It might be getting off gas, it might be improving the insulation, it might be draft proofing. I don't do those things. I don't offer those things as service, but I just work with the client to try to work out a priority list. And we are raffling one of those three-hour sessions tonight. Um, so hopefully the, the winner actually needs this service and is, is willing to have me in their home for three hours where we can look at everything, crawl up in the roof space, look at the energy bills, try to figure out what uh, is the best bang for buck things you could be doing. Is it better drapes for the windows? Is it uh, underfloor insulation? Those are the sorts of things I help people to try to, try to sort out. So that gets me out of the house uh, these days and, uh, and um, gets me all over Melbourne. So um, it's been quite a lot of fun taking up that sort of activity, which as an engineer, okay, heat pumps and things, that's a bit of chemical engineering there, so it's still a bit of an extension for what I used to do in industry at a bigger scale. So the, uh, the next slide, this is what we're talking about these days, the all-electric home. We uh, don't need to be burning things in, in our homes anymore. We used to get a lot of joy in the old days out of burning wood, gas, LPG, diesel, petrol, kerosene, whatever you wanted to burn in your house, we could burn it. Uh, that was what we did, but we don't have to do that anymore. And in fact, it would be economic, uh, a far better thing. If we didn't, it would be better for our health. If we didn't, it'd be better for the planet if we didn't. So how do you do that? How do you set up an all-electric home where we don't need to be burning stuff. That's what I'll be talking about tonight. And the, what I'll be presenting is based to a certain extent, <clears throat> it's based on a volunteer work we did with Beyond Zero Emissions of, you know, way back. And it's based on some of this research work that I had the opportunity to produce out of the University of Melbourne. So uh, for a few years I had a casual research position at the University of Melbourne and we looked at things from pumped hydro energy storage to the methane emissions from unconventional gas production. Um, we looked at hydrogen uh, and ammonia and those sorts of uh, opportunities for Australia. But we also looked at the home economics of heating the house with heat pumps. And so that's all been published in the form of papers there. If you Google my name, you'll find these, find these things. If you Google my name and heat pump, there'll be various things come up. And uh, published a few articles here and there, such as in Renew Magazine, 
or on the website Renew Economy where we talk about these uh, opportunities that we have. And that's a good time for me to mention some of the other um, information sources that are available that uh, if you prefer things still in the old, the old hard copy method, everything's online, but uh, sometimes the magazines are good. So this is Renew Magazine, published by the struggling not-for-profit organization Renew. Lots of good stuff in there about things you can do in your home. A lot of it is available free of the paywall, but uh, you may want to contribute to this uh, struggling not-for-profit organization. So I've published a number of articles in there, and Alan publishes one just about every quarter when this comes out. Another resource is uh, the Bible, Your Home, yourhome.gov.au. And uh, so if you are planning a, a renovation or a, a new build of a house, well, you want to read this every page of this. Of course, it's all available online in PDF form, but this is a hard copy. And there is a new version of this meant to be coming out someday um, because it, this is a little bit out of date with respect to things like the all-electric home and getting your home away from burning things. So that's your, your home, still very useful. And another resource that I'll come back to later is Energy Freedom Home, which was uh, produced by Richard Keach for Beyond Zero Emissions. And this book talks about how you can get your home off of all those combustible fuels and uh, save money and even make money. If you, get, uh, if you have the opportunity for a large solar PV system on the roof, you can actually set up your home so that it really costs you nothing for heating and cooling and hot water, and rather you can be making money by selling electricity out onto the grid. So I'll come back to the re that resource later, but I only have two hands, so I can't open it up for you. I wonder what the next slide is. Yes, please. Oh, those are just some, some articles. When we produced the work out of the University of Melbourne, of course, we, uh, we went to the media, and it was, got picked up by The Age and Domain and The Herald Sun and the ABC, and so that was all good, trying to get the uh, information out to people that the cheapest way to heat your home is with your reverse cycle air conditioner, not with your gas heating system. But of course, we published the research on the 1st of September, you know, the last day after winter was gone. So uh, we had a brief opportunity in the media there. And uh, so I had this message about how people could save a lot of money by using their air conditioners. We, at our house, our old weatherboard in Sandringham, we've got air conditioners at either end of the house now, and we heat the house for a third the cost of what it used to cost with the ducted gas heating. And that was the same sort of thing that we found at University of Melbourne the same sort of thing that other people's, people have calculated. As the price of gas keeps coming up and the, and the efficiency of air conditioners improves, why well, we just find that these uh, you know, quite large savings are possible. But how to get the message out? And so I suppose it was my kids that said, Dad, you have a message you want to get out there? Well, there's, there's this thing called social media. Have you heard of it? Have you heard of Facebook? And uh, so that was the beginning of this descent into Facebook to, to where I still reside, unfortunately. Well, we started this Facebook group, My Efficient Electric Home. If you're not in there already, you're certainly welcome to join. 27,500 members. We get 200 new members a week coming in, so it is growing uh, quite a lot. And it's an opportunity there where every day people are sharing experiences and trying to figure out how to best set up their homes. <clears throat> So we'll talk about what you can do in your homes, but I've, first I suppose I should just remind everybody why gas is not an economic choice, it's expensive, why is it expensive, and it's not a clean choice because it pollutes, the gas industry likes to say it's cleaner than coal, it's probably dirtier than coal, it's definitely dirtier than renewables, and I think that's the main, main thing. So let's cover these points first, why is gas expensive? Australia produces a lot of gas, there's no doubt about it. I used to work in that industry. I used to design plants for exporting gas, and uh, we've done a good job of that. We, as that pie chart shows, we export 81% of the gas that's produced in Australia. Uh, whether it's produced in Western Australia, the Northern Territory, um, gas from Queensland, the coal seam gas, a lot of that's exported. So 81%. It used to be that, on the East Coast anyway, gas was cheap because, look, it was just a, a cheap byproduct from the oil production down in Bass Strait, and you had this gas that was actually getting in the way of the oil production. So let's get rid of this stuff. Let's use it for anything. Let's heat water. Let's do stupid things like heat homes. Uh, of course, use it in industry and use it to generate electricity. Use it to make great balls of fire outside of the casino. Wouldn't that be a good idea? <laughs> so we had all these uh, options for, for gas. But um, what happened was in 2015, you know, because the system's all connected up now from Tasmania all the, all the way to Queensland by pipelines, in 2015 is when really the, the production of the coal seam gas in Queensland started and they wanted to produce just so much of that stuff it had to be exported. 
But because the whole system's connected up, that gave producers down here in Victoria, like ESSO and BHP, the opportunity to say, oh, well, hang on, that gas we've been giving away you know, very cheaply for years, mm, maybe we could export it out of Queensland. And they used that leverage to then turn what had been a buyer's market into a seller's market for gas, and that's where we're at. So the price of gas on the wholesale side doubled and doubled again. And uh, so gas is very expensive now in Australia, quite surprisingly, but there, we're, there we are. But, so you could say that's bad news, um, but, it's, but actually it could be seen as good news because it's a fossil fuel, it's expensive now, we got cheaper options like turning on our air conditioners, so let's, let's explore that. Next slide, please. Uh, just a bit more detail. Um, you know, so in the, uh, you know, for the last few decades, come winter time, Victoria wants to use a lot of gas, okay, you just get it out of Bass Strait. Not, no problem, that's what the system was set up to do, and so we've all been enjoying that source of heat and energy for, for decades. But no one said Bass Strait was going to last forever, only 55 years or so. So this chart here on the top shows that, uh, say in 2018, all that, uh, the red, this is for a whole year, and you see the jagged line, that's the demand for gas in the eastern states, uh, excluding Queensland. So New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania, South Australia, that jagged line across for 2018, that's the demand for gas. And we, we demand more in winter, as you can see, the peak in the middle of the year is the winter time. But it didn't matter, because in the old days, you had Bass Strait and Moomba and some of the other f conventional fields producing a lot of gas. That's that big red section. And to meet some of the wintertime peak, some gas would come down the pipelines from further up north just to do some topping up. There's a gas storage facility out in, uh, near the Otways like the squirrel does with the nuts, we, uh, you know, that uh, gas storage facility, gas goes in there in the summertime, but then it can come out in the wintertime to meet these peak demands. So everything was sweet, and that's the way it had been for decades. But at uh, one point, <coughs> SO and BHP looked to the future and realized that uh, Bass Strait was running down, not completely running out, but running down, and so they told the authorities that say, that bottom graph there, that's 2025, it could be 2024, 2023, that uh, Bass Strait is running down and it will not be able to produce the gas that it used to do, uh, particularly in the middle of winter. So you can see the red bit, which used to be the good old Bass Strait bit, etc., gets a lot smaller for 2025 or 2024. And uh, so what do we do? You know, we're all going to be freezing in the dark. We won't have any gas to heat our homes. Um, we will bring as much coal seam gas as possible down those pipelines. That's the yellow bit. So the gas that um, Bass Strait isn't producing, some of that will be the coal seam gas now, so Victorians will be using Queensland coal seam gas pretty much all year. But then in the winter, it even still leaves a, a gap. You know, how are, we, uh, how are we going to supply that gas demand? And that's why you had crowds like AGL proposing a gas import tor terminal for Western Port Bay. But that's now been <coughs> rejected on environmental grounds. You still have Viva Energy saying they'd be happy to have a gas import terminal in Geelong. Twiggy Forest wants to have one up in New South Wales and there are other proposals. So it may be that this gap gets filled by gas that might even come from the Middle East, or it might come from New South Wales, or sorry, sorry, it might come from the Northwest Shelf of Western Australia, uh, or the Northern Territory, but it could come from the Middle East. But one thing we know for that sort of gas, it's not gonna be cheap. So we're not gonna be seeing cheap gas again in Victoria. And I've got another proposal, and that is that if we could get homes off of gas, then we wouldn't have that gas demand in the middle of winter anymore. And so that's another way to deal with this situation, which turns out makes a lot of economic sense. So that's why gas isn't cheap anymore. I hope I've explained that. And gas isn't that clean either. Here we see, can't see it very well, but it's a gas exploration, exploration appraisal well flaring off in the Kunawar uh, wine region there. You see a lot of nice uh, grapes and uh, uh, <clears throat> growing there in front of the gas stack, but uh, they're exploring for a bit of gas there in the Kutawara region. But anyway, the gas industry likes to say that they're cleaner than coal, but the problem is that gas, methane, is a powerful greenhouse gas, and the more of that that gets uh, leaked, released, vented, uh, works its way into the atmosphere, well, you only have to leak about 3% of that, uh, uh, and if you leak any more, well then if you're making electricity, well gas is going to be dirtier than coal anyway. But when it comes to homes, not a lot of people using coal to heat their homes anymore. So um, 
you know, gas isn't competing with, with coal in the home market, and gas is definitely dirtier than tapping into renewable energy like you can do with a heat pump. Um, so this is some of the clean green gas industry up in, in Queensland. So basically, for the coal seam gas, you just, uh, you just have to pin cushion the whole countryside to get any gas out of it. It's not like the good old days in the Bass Strait where a few wells could basically light up Melbourne. Here you have to um, drill something like 50,000 wells across Queensland and New South Wales. This is the before and after photo, and the one on the, the side there shows 150 wells, but let's think about 40,000 wells. Okay, so you've got to visually multiply that by about 300 times in your mind. And there's people that live up there. You know, it's not like this is a deserted area. There, there are people who moved up there. They thought it would be a nice place to live, and then this happened. Or they were running farms or businesses. Um, some people may have collected a bit of money off the gas companies, but others have just uh, got so disgusted with it they just sold and got out of there. So these are some of the impacts even, even beyond the climate impacts, the air pollution impacts. Of course, we can't see what's happening underneath the ground. To get to the coal seam gas, they have to pump out all the water and do something with that. So it's uh, highly invasive. <clears throat> uh, all right, so yeah, when you, when you pump the water out of the coal seams, that's what you have to do to get to the gas. And you hope that the gas comes up into your wells that you drilled. But it might just decide it would rather bubble up out of a river if the geology's uh, right for that. And that's what you see. And it's not just leaking at the rivers. It's just at the rivers is where you can see the bubbles. You can't see gas bubbling up out of a paddock very well, even though it might be doing so. Um, but at the rivers here, you can see what's going on. And it's an indication of an industry a bit out of control up in Queensland. And that's the gas that Victorians even will be using in greater and greater amounts over the next few years. But there is some good news in all of this. This is the demand for gas in eastern Australia. The gas industry won't tell you that. They won't tell you this, but the use of gas in eastern Australia actually peaked in 2012. So that was peak gas for eastern Australia, and it's been going down, downhill since. Here I drew a 2% growth trend line. So before, the gas industry would have thought the demand for gas would keep growing as the economy grew, as we had population growth in Australia. But that hasn't happened. So we see gas demand declining. Less gas is being used to make electricity because we have the renewables happening now. Uh, and the price of gas, since 2015 anyway, has gone up in price a lot. So industry is trying to figure out how to use less gas. Some industries have closed, part, partly because of expensive gas. And then we have homes that can uh, do better things than just burn a lot of gas. So that's why we see the projections of the gas demand falling, which is good. I'd like to see them fall a lot more quickly. And if we used a lot less gas in Victorian homes, we, we can make a big difference. The use of gas in homes is a big chunk of the gas that is used uh, across Eastern Australia. We don't use that much for making electricity. Even industry doesn't necessarily use that much. We burn a lot of gas in Victorian homes, and we are wasting all of it. Every bit of gas we use in homes these days we're wasting because there are cheaper options. And for some people, using those options can be as easy as going home tonight and finding the remote control from the air conditioner that you put away you know, in February. The last time you used your air conditioner was in summer. You never thought about using it for heating. Well, go find that remote control, turn on your air conditioner, and that can be the cheapest way to heat your house. So it's a big economic loss that we're burning expensive gas when we have other options. You don't hear the economists talking about this too much. You, you know, you hear about poor struggling families on a budget, but does anybody tell them the cheapest way to heat their house is by turning on the air conditioner? Those are, that's for folks that have the air conditioner, and more and more homes do, certainly, but some don't. So for some homes, there will be a need to invest in air conditioners to displace the gas heating equipment. And what we saw in the recent Victorian budget is, in fact, they do want to replace a, a quarter of a million heaters in homes that the government has responsibility for, for and so they'll re be replacing old gas and wood heaters with uh, modern reverse cycle air conditioners as part of the Victorian budget, which was good news. That's actually quite a lot of gas that uh, we won't be burning once that project gets finished. But yeah, billions. So we're spending, you know, Victorian homes spending two or three billion dollars a year on gas. We don't need to do that anymore. We've got other options. Um, so we do have heating options at home. Are we going to heat with gas? Are we going to heat with resistive electric devices or the reverse cycle air con? So resistive electric, that's like a toaster. 
basically electricity heats some wires and you get heat out of it. So that's your panel heaters, your oil column heaters, your fan heaters, your heat lamps, all those fairly simple devices. 100% efficient, sounds good. You put a unit of electricity into it, you get a unit of heat coming out of it. Um, but there's a better way, and it's called the heat pump, the reverse cycle air conditioner. With these, you can put in one unit of electricity, and you can get four units of heat coming out of it. Buy one, get four. My wife says she's never found a deal like that for shoes. So we should definitely be tapping into it for, for heating our house. So uh, tonight, I checked. I came over here the other day. There's no gas heating this place right now. We are heating this room here with reverse cycle air conditioner. Up on the roof is the equipment, the refrigeration equipment that is sucking heat out of the air and bringing it, heating it up to the temperatures we need to be comfortable and bringing it into the, the room. So no gas is being burned here tonight. Um, like the, uh, you know, the Bayside Council does some things. A fellow from Bayside Council said the library refurbishment in Sandringham, he said, Tim, you'll be pleased there's no gas there. So I walked around the building, I couldn't find a gas meter at the new Bayside Library refur refurbishment. It certainly has the solar panels on the top, but for heating and cooling, they'll be using a reverse cycle air conditioner, like we all will be someday. Maybe you can't do that tonight, maybe you can't do it this winter, but someday you'll be heating your Melbourne house with a reverse cycle air conditioner. Uh, no, no, back to that one, we had not covered that one. Yes, yeah, so how do they work? That's the problem. People don't know how they work. They're magic, they have a refrigerant system in there. Uh, you know, it's a mystery how they work, and so that's part of the problem. What do we want to call them? Do we want to call them heat pumps or reverse cycle air conditioners? We've got a language problem. So how do they work? Well, very quickly, let's imagine we're halfway up a hill, and we have some water. And uh, if you tip the water out of a cup, and you're halfway up a hill, the water by nature wants to go downhill. But it is possible to get the water to the top of the hill. What do we do? We buy a water pump, and people can get their head around that. Well, it turns out that heat, like water, is a thing. And if you have some heat, like in your kitchen, where's it gonna to wanna to go naturally? It's gonna to wanna to go from a warm place to a cold place. So heat wants to go from your kitchen into your refrigerator to contaminate your food. <clears throat> and, uh, but uh, fortunately someone, and they say his name was Harrison and he lived in Geelong, he invented refrigeration. And so what that does when your refrigerator is, there's a refrigerant fluid in there going round and round at one point in the cycle, it goes through an expansion valve and gets really cold. That's great. We've got cold refrigerant. It can go through a heat exchanger inside your fridge and suck the heat back away from the food. Fantastic. We've captured the heat. Now what do we do with it? We need to get it back out into the kitchen. So the refrigerant continues along its cycle, goes through a compressor, gets hot enough now that the heat that had been collected around the food can be transferred back out into your kitchen through the heat exchanger that surrounds your refrigerator. So that was the the invention of refrigeration, fantastic. We can keep the, the food and the beer cold, thanks to Harrison. And then someone said, well, if we, can, <clears throat> if we can cool off the space in a refrigerator, perhaps we can cool an entire room on a hot summer day. And so they invented air conditioning. Same situation, same technology. Refrigerant that gets cold at one point, collects the heat in the room, and then goes through the compressor, the refrigerant gets hot, and it can throw that heat outside of the house. So, Lots of us have walked past these things on a hot summer day and you feel the hot air coming out of these things. That's because this fan is sucking air behind the device and then blows that air over the, this hot refrigerant and that heat then is rejected to outside the house. And so now the refrigerant's a little bit cooler and it can go through the expansion valve, get really cold and go back up here. There's a fan up here where the air blows over here to uh, absorb the heat from your lounge room on the hot summer day. So we invented air conditioning for the summertime. And then someone said, well, we ought to be able to turn that around backwards and call it a reverse cycle air conditioner. And when it does that, and so if you go home tonight, turn on your air conditioner on the heating setting, heat, find the heat button, walk near this thing tonight, and the air out here will be freezing cold because the system is working backwards, reverse. The refrigerant at this point is very cold. The air gets blown over the refrigerant, which warms it up. That is the way that it captures free renewable heat from outside your house. That warms up the refrigerant, which then goes through the compressor, gets even hotter, then now it can put heat into the room, which is what's going on up there. So on the top of the roof, there's the outside unit, and if we went up on the roof and walked past it, there would be all this cold air being blown around because it's sucking the heat out of the atmosphere up there, pumping up to the temperatures we need to heat here. 
That's how they work. Or you could just consider it magic. I'm not sure. Whatever's more convenient. Next slide, please. And that's all that this shows is that for one unit of electricity, you can be getting five units of heat coming out. It's another form of solar energy. OK, maybe it's chilly outside tonight, 13 degrees. But it's not minus 200, thanks to the sun. The sun heats up our air. We can harvest that heat from the air, even in the middle of the night, even if it's three degrees outside, or minus 10. If your heat pump, your reverse cycle air conditioner, is built for those conditions, you can extract heat out of the air, even if it's 20 below. Next slide, please. Um, so cost, which is a key thing for most people. Again, these are the resistive electric things, 100% efficient. One unit of electricity gives you one unit of heat. But aha, over here, one unit of electricity might be giving us five units of heat. So that's why this building is using a reverse cycle air conditioner rather than just some radiant heat panels that you find around the place. You go to a cafe, and they've got a radiant heater up there just to you know, heat up the sidewalk. Not very efficient. It's not a heat pump. If they're using something like this, they'd be saving a lot of money. Um, and then versus gas. So possibly you can use these for a third the cost of using gas. Like I said, these are like 400, 500% efficient, essentially. Gas isn't even 100% efficient. When you buy gas, the first thing you do is you set fire to it, and a lot of the energy goes up the chimney. What a waste. And so that means that the efficiency of gas is a lot less than 100%. Uh, then plus, if you have a ducted system, you could be losing energy out the ducts and uh, you know, trying to heat up a whole house with a ducted system. If it works for you, just turn on an air conditioner. You might find you're able to stay comfortable in a part of your house at a fraction of the cost of burning gas. Um, for those of us lucky enough to have the solar PV on the roof, you might even, if it's a sunny day and you're making some electricity, choose to run your air conditioner to heat the house. Certainly, you might be using it to cool it in the summer as well. But in winter, you can use your electricity, which you probably don't get a lot for selling out under the grid these days. Use it to run your heat pump to heat your house, and everybody can be comfortable at a very low cost. That's the advantage if you have the solar panels. At our house, we've got a good northern exposure, so we don't often really need a lot of heat when the sun is out. But I might turn on the air conditioner for, for the heck of it, put a bit more heat into the house, and then later, you know, 5 o'clock at night or whatever, the sun's gone down, the, the house is already a bit warm, and we've done that quite cheaply, and we can leave maybe the heater off for the rest of the night, depending on the conditions. Now, <clears throat> aesthetics is always important in the home, and not, every, not everybody likes to look at these things. Of course, I think they're amazing, but um, not everybody feels that way. But you need to realize that there's more than one type of reverse cycle air conditioner. These are not ducted systems. There are ducted systems, but even with the not ducted systems, well, there, there's units that don't have to be up on the wall. They can be down toward the floor. And apparently, if you go to Tasmania, go to New Zealand, this is the sort of heat pump that you'll find people using because they realize mostly they're going to be using them for heating, and you'd rather your heating system was down near the floor rather than, than up high. Uh, this is not ideal, trying to bring the heat in from on high, but um, that was one way for them to to put the heating system out of the way where we don't really see it too much. But anyway, even for homes, you have different options, including these sort of ceiling cassettes or bulkhead units. So you, people can get quite, quite creative with the way that you try to use these technologies, particularly if you're talking about a new build, then you've got more fl flexibility than in an existing house. Uh, I spend some time with people looking at their plans, and the architects will have these plans all sketched up for the kitchen. You'll be able to see every kitchen tap, and you'll be able to see the the toilet and, and everything, maybe even the soap dish. But the architect is not even bothered to sketch on there what sort of heating system it's going to be and, and where it will be located in the plan. So that's a message I have for architects. Start thinking about how these people are actually going to be heating and cooling the house, what sort of equipment they'll use, and how you'll set all that up. In the old days, it was just, oh, bung some ducted gas heating underneath the floor. That'll do it. But there's more sophisticated thinking we can have now. Um, with the Facebook group, 27,000 people doing this sort of thing, and here's some of the uh, testimonials. So I'll read Jackie's here. We used our reverse cycle air conditioner this winter in Canberra. Canberra is meant to be notoriously cold, right? Worked great and on track to save $1,100 on heating costs compared to last year on gas. Very happy. You might have caught <coughs> uh, a headline on one of those previous articles. The Melbourne Uni stuff we did, we said a medium 
Victorian home back then in 2015 could save $658 a year just by choosing to heat with an air conditioner rather than ducted gas. Depending on how big your house, your, how big your house is, how inefficient or efficient it might be, and how many people are there, if you're working from home, all these things change the numbers. But obviously a lot of people here happy that this is working for them, even in uh, Canberra, Ballarat, other places uh, colder than Melbourne. I, and, uh, and it's not just about cost all the time, or even about just comfort. Sometimes it's about health and safety. So if you still have a gas heater, you need to get it checked every couple of years to make sure it's not producing poisonous carbon monoxide gas that could kill you. Um, and that's one of the reasons, one of the drivers for the Victorian government to be taking gas heaters out of people's homes and instead putting in reverse cycle air conditioners because they're not going to die from carbon monoxide poisoning. And they're even finding these days that any burning of stuff in the home, like even cooking with gas at home, well, that's linked to 12% of childhood, as childhood asthma now. So uh, burning anything in the home is really not ideal. We don't have to do that anymore. We can save money, be comfortable, be a bit healthier, help the climate. Uh, you can uh, heat, uh, you know, if you can heat your house with an air source heat pump, you can heat your water with an air source heat pump. And so that's what this thing is doing. This is not heating the house, this is heating the water, that's all. So this is a kind of a split system for uh, heat pump hot water. This is, this is the heat pump part, that's just the storage tank. So this sucks heat out of the air and heats the water, stores it, kind of like a battery. I mean, if you set this up to run in the middle of the day, maybe off your solar panels, then this is very cheap hot water that you can have sitting here for more than 24 hours uh, in that tank. So that's kind of a way of storing energy. Again, you know, this, with this one, it might be 300% efficient or 400% efficient. So one unit of electricity gives you four parts of hot water in a heat pump like this. Other heat pump designs for hot water, the air conditioner bit will, will be on top of the tank. It'll be all one piece. So that's another type you can see. And, uh, Look, that was space heating and hot water with gas. The other thing we do with gas is cooking. And of course, a re recommendation there is to try the induction cooktop, which um, could be expensive if you went out and bought a really expensive one and your electrician had trouble installing it. But another option you see over here is this person has spent two times $50 on portable induction cooktops from Audi or Ikea, put them on top of the old gas heater, and there, boom, now they don't have a gas bill anymore. Uh, you pay about $300 a year just to be connected to gas. So if the last thing you have on gas is cooking, you'll find you've got a big bill, but you're hardly buying any gas. It's just the connection charges. So uh, moving to that induction cooktop is recommended there. Um, so if you reach that point, then getting rid of the gas meter altogether is a thing now. Um, some people ring up the gas company and say, get rid of that thing, because it's a, it's a way to guarantee you won't be getting a gas bill, and it sends a message to the, the fossil fuel producers. But my son got his house off gas, but he didn't, I said, get rid of the gas meter, and he's like, ah, don't worry about it, I don't get a bill anymore. A year later, he got a bill again, because he was still on a database. And so AGL tried it on, they said, oh, there's still a gas meter at that house, we're gonna send him a bill, see what happens. So he was able to get hold of AGL and make that bill go away, but then he made the, the meter go away as well. And then you can put like a pot plant here, so very nice. Um, so who, who's saying that? Is it just us here tonight? Um, this was the, the work done by the organization Renew, where again they added up how many tens of thousands of dollars homes could save if they didn't use any gas. And so that did get picked up in the Herald Sun. Uh, Choice Magazine now is, is, uh, has got the message. Choice Magazine had an article the other day about winter heating options. They didn't even mention gas, so I thought that was progress. <laughs> they were trying to educate people about the difference between resistive electric heating versus the heat pumps. Didn't even mention gas, amazing. And the Victorian government is, uh, <clears throat> says some good things on some of their web pages, on some of their other web pages, not so good. But um, yeah, you go to that part of the Victorian government and they're talking about the all-electric home, planning for the all-electric home. So there's some other people talking about the all-electric home and another crowd, AGL. AGL was kind of having a bet both ways. They were trying to import gas to Western Port, but that's gotten, gotten crossed off the list. Uh, but at the same time, they were telling people not to use gas. So they interviewed me and some others. They wrote down everything we said, and, and they put it on their web pages, which I thought was amazing. Not web pages that are easily found, but uh, they're out there. So if you want to find the AGL web pages that say don't buy gas, uh, they're out there. Um, I just wanted to point this out. So this chart. 
is from this book from Richard Keach. And Richard's one of the co-admins at the Facebook group. And Richard uh, got his Essendon house off of gas, and it's documented in this book as a case study. So if, that was one of our first glowing examples of a home. Uh, again, an older weatherboard. And uh, they'll be selling the house soon because they've, they've built a new place down at the Cape Patterson Eco Village. But uh, so if anybody wants to buy a very good performing home in Essendon, it will be on the market. <laughs> and this is where it was in 2006 in energy units, megajoules, or you could plot this in kilowatt hours with the right conversion. But anyway, Richard's house in 2006 used uh, this much gas, the red stuff, and this much, elect much electricity. And then over time, he got his house off gas. So by 2012, his house was off gas. And his electricity use hardly went up. And this doesn't even consider the three different solar systems that Richard bought over time. If you did consider those, then you could completely wipe that out. So his house is you know, beyond net zero emissions, energy bills, um, electricity, all that stuff. But the point here is that you know, these air conditioners are so efficient now, you, it's not that you necessarily need to see any big increase in your electricity use, particularly if at the same time you might have done something about draft proofing or about insulation or you got an, a better TV or you changed out the, the halogen downlights or uh, you got a better clothes dryer. All those things can reduce your electricity use. And so over time you look back and say, wow, how, the, how did I do that? That's the Energy Freedom Home book. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about the heat pumps. Hopefully everybody now is an expert on heat pumps and refrigeration. Uh, but we can't forget the thermal envelope of the building because if you have a leaky, a leaky house, you're going to be challenged to heat it by whatever method. And the analogy that Richard uses is a leaky bucket. All of our homes leak. They're not thermos bottles. Um, you put heat into them, that heat continuously leaks out through the insulation if you have some, through the windows etc. through cracks and gaps as the air blows in and out of the house. So it's a leaky bucket. Um, if you're cold at home, you can just try, you know, putting more heat into the bucket, but if it's just all leaking out, you're going to spend a lot of money doing that. So it makes, ten makes sense to try to improve that bucket a bit, reduce the leaks, whether that's by attention to insulation, improving the, the uh, treatments on your windows, the drapes, etc., and uh, draft sealing. So this is um, <clears throat> just a bit of a look at insulation, so I climb up into people's roof spaces and have a look. <laughs> I'll ask a client, I'll say, do you want me to crawl up in the roof space? And I say, no, no, we got great insulation up there, don't worry about it. So I do it anyway, it's part of the job. Climb up in there, have a look around, come back, and I said, so when was the NBN guy up there? And I said, oh yeah, 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 the NBN guy was up there a couple weeks ago. I said, okay, well he's moved all your insulation from the left part of the house over to the right, and he's not put it back. <clears throat> so I've been in houses where that's been the, the situation for 10 years, they didn't know. It's like, oh yeah, that, that part of the house was pretty hot in summer, didn't know why. You know, I thought maybe the air conditioner wasn't working. So they were pointing fingers at the air conditioner when it was really their thermal envelope had been corrupted. So anybody that goes up in your roof space is going to bugger up your um, insulation, so you need to fix that. But there's even still lots of places in Melbourne where there is no insulation at all. Um, so that's something to get up into that roof space and see what you have. And it's also even possible to, in some cases, retrofit insulation under the floors or blow it into the walls. Here's a crowd, they're drilling holes in the back of my house and blowing insulation into the walls. And now that's the best room in the house. Very good. Um, so a client the other day was saying, oh, $3,000 for underfloor insulation, I'm not sure if I can justify that. I said a modern home this day would have, you know, if you bought a new home, a modern home, it would have underfloor insulation. It would already be in your mortgage. So you might as well be comfortable, save a bit of energy, do the right thing, get, bring your house up to a more modern standard, and because it would already be in your mortgage if you'd bought a more modern house anyway. Um, air leakage. <clears throat> so Melbourne homes are notoriously leaky. We refer to them often as glorified tents. Um, in fact, I've been in some tents that have been more comfortable than some Melbourne homes. And in some houses, look, they've got the chimneys, they've got the wall vents, there's cracks in the floor, there's gaps around the architraves. And so a lot of air is just leaking in and out of the house. And this can be scientifically tested if you want to pay a guy to do a blower door test. So they put a blower on your front door and mask off the rest of the door and they try to suck all the air out of your house with the blower. And then with a the smoke machine, you can go around and you can see every crack and gap where it's coming from underneath the dishwasher. Oh yeah, I always felt a draft underneath the dishwasher. Well, that's just because they drilled a hole through the floor or something, never sealed it up. <clears throat> or, um, <clears throat> you know, 
Oh, yeah, the, the mice used to come through there. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's another place you can see all the cracks and gaps. So the smoke machine helps, but also they can use pressure measurements and they can calculate. They could say, look, basically under windy sort of conditions, your home has 30 air changes per hour. What does that mean? It means every two minutes, all the air is being swept out of your house on a windy day. Or it might even be, might even be every minute. There's homes like that, you know, got three, four old chimneys with no dampers on them. Tim chimneys are designed to take the air out of your house. The bathroom extraction fans with no dampers, they just suck all the air out of your house. Of course, the cracks under the doors and all that, straight in and straight out. So if you're changing over the air in your house on a windy day every two minutes, how you meant to have low energy bills, how you meant to be comfortable. So all that can be addressed. So there are methods to tighten up a house. Costs money, of course. Some of it can be done DIY. Some of the draft proofing stuff is some of the easier stuff to, to try on a DIY basis, but it makes a, a heck of an improvement. Um, and a modern house would be more sealed from the elements. But one of the things when you tighten up a house, you then need to worry about the moisture. Because you, I've been in some houses and I said, do you get any moisture on these single glazed windows? Oh, no, no, no problem. And it's because they've got the wall vents, they've got all this air blowing through their house all the time. So if they seal those things up, then they might find suddenly they've got moisture on the windows on a cold morning that they never saw before. And that's not good because all that moisture in the place can lead to mold and just a high humidity in the home. And so there's ways around that too, though. Once you're sealing up the house, it's like, okay, where'd the moisture come from? Oh, well, we, we like to dry clothes by just hanging them on racks because that's a, you know, the green thing to do or the low cost or you know, efficient thing to do. Well, not necessarily. If you're drying clothing on racks in the house, and you're trying to tighten up the house, then where did all that moisture go? So um, you need to keep track of these things or you can end up having a bit of a period where you, we've got some moisture issues before you get around to fixing those. Uh, which brings up the, the topic of the heat pump condensing clothes dryer. So there's clothes dryers on the market these days right up to 10 stars. In the old days, you had a dryer, it was kind of like a toaster. Again, an electric wire got heated up and the clothes were dry, and then you had all this moist air that either you had to vent outside or it made the laundry room all moist or whatever. And it cost a bomb because it was only one star, and so you ended up hanging your laundry over racks throughout the house. Mm -hmm. Well, these days, it comes at a cost, but uh, this is mostly what you find in the white goods shops these days are the heat pump condensing dryers. It's got nothing to do with renewable energy, you know, unless you're running it during the daytime off your solar panels. It doesn't suck free heat out of the air, but what it is is it's just super efficient and it makes sure that no heat is lost, it, lost anywhere. Uh, when it condenses the water and puts it in a little bin for you, it, it, ret it retrieves the heat from all that. So um, very efficient, right up to 10 stars, which means with every star you get like a 10% reduction in your bills. So if you have a one star dryer, you can go buy a 10 star dryer, it's hardly going to cost anything. Plus, it's going to condense all the water, put it in a little bin, that you can use to water the pot plant that you have now where you used to have the gas meter. Um, so quite, a, quite efficient technology that people should be aware of. A lot of my clients, I'm like, yeah, how are you drying your clothes? Yeah, we're hanging them out. I'm like, do you know these other things exist? And you know, they might have two kids running around. They're like, I might just get one of those things. Because <laughs> you know? they've got a lot of laundry, but they didn't want the big energy bills you'd have with a standard dryer. Well, you don't need to buy a standard dryer anymore. These heat pump dryers exist. And you can, you can keep track of other things in the house. You know, if you want to get high tech with it, there are some very low cost sensors available that you can track humidity particulates. Like when we had the bushfires and it was difficult to breathe, a lot of people were tracking particulates in their home because of the bushfires. And then the bushfires went away and they still had high particulates and it turned out it was because of their cooking from their, <laughs> from their gas stove. So uh, you, can, you can measure the quality of these things in the house, carbon dioxide levels, are you getting enough fresh air? People say, I don't want to tighten up my house, then you know, how will I breathe? Where will I get fresh air? Well, we have the technology called windows. So you open the window and you let the fresh air in uh, enough to, to make sure you've managed carbon dioxide and moisture, et cetera. And next, uh, windows are part of your thermal envelope. And, and of course, they're critical because the weakest link in your house is probably going to be the windows. Even if they're double glazed, they're still going to be the weakest link. And, um, so covering up windows with good window treatments at night or any other time you're trying to retain heat in the house uh, is a good option. A lot of people, you know, we, we build these houses, we build these renovations, it's all glass, it looks lovely, but it makes it expensive and uncomfortable. So just thinking these things through, 
how, what sort of drapes or window coverings will, will I get? How will we actually use those? All very important if you're doing a renovation or a new house. And then monitoring electricity use. If we're going over to the electric home, well, we need to understand that electricity use. And because of the smart meters, largely, that we all have on our houses now, they're beaming information back to headquarters every 30 seconds. So if you're looking at your AGL bill and you can see your electricity use every quarter, but they know what you're doing every 30 seconds, that's kind of like a power imbalance. So you can get that information too. In fact, this thing, you could write this down. Power Pal is available to Victorian homes for free. Well, paid by the taxpayer, but it's a device that can give you instantaneous uh, uh, visibility of your electricity use. And there's other methods. I get my electricity from PowerShop. I like the way that they plot it up in a heat map here. I can look back and you know, it'll, it'll say, you know, in the last year, your greatest use during the 30 minute period was on the 6th of June from 6 to 6.30. And you can go back and say, oh, what were we doing then? Having a party. So it is possible to monitor our electricity use and make sure we don't have any unpleasant surprises as we move to the electrified home. And a couple of last images here. It's all very good to have this equipment, but you actually need to have some idea what it's doing. Filters, a key feature. This would be for a ducted system. This is a client of mine. Uh, filters in the air conditioners. This guy was a CSIRO met metallurgist. He, did, he didn't know there were, were filters in air conditioners, but there are, and so you need to clean those, otherwise it's not going to work properly. A lot of people say, nah, my air conditioner's no good. I can't heat with that. I'll use the gas. Uh, did you know there's a filter in there? What? <laughs> so they, and then you open it up. Oh, yuck. So um, very important to check the filters and keep things operating properly. We're almost done? Yeah, this winter heat with your air con. Look, uh, we could complain about governments not doing enough, not spreading the word. And I'm one of those persons I complain. But then it occurred to me, like with the Facebook group, 20, 27,000 people there, we're going to have a bit of a campaign in May where we try to tell everybody we know on social media or outside of social media to heat with your air con this winter. So um, the heck with governments, heck with all that other stuff. Um, possibly we've got the power on social media to spread the word and uh, try to let people know there's cheaper ways to heat their house. And that's the end. Ooh.